Second, in the second section uh, of, uh, of my lecture, I want to talk about what some are calling author 2.0. And this is uh, about entrepreneurial writers. So uh, in the past, the big book publishers controlled everything. And kind of like still in the academic sphere, uh, you know, the, the academic publishers still do. And that's why they can <laughs> have uh, people like me writing their books for nothing. You know, they have such control. Um, and But nowadays, it is possible to be independent. You don't have to go after a publisher and beg them to publish your book. You can do it yourself, and you can begin selling on on uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble and other websites uh, yourself. You you become the the not just the author but the publisher for all intents and purposes. And Amazon and other like locations are are distributors. Uh, they are not. Uh, they do not own your copyright and they do not own you. Uh, we already talked about the long tail, and that's that's what makes it possible is that Amazon can afford to have millions of writers because if you, if nobody buys a book it doesn't hurt them really uh they do a little bit of tech work for it and have a little bit of bandwidth but you know the, the good books uh make up for the bad books so to speak and uh, bad in the sense of not selling very much and not marketing very much um so and we i was again raised some questions um uh, that we could discuss, but uh, since we're not in a real classroom, we won't try that. Let's look at some, some trends here. The big trends facing the future of publishing. Book selling is, is moving online as brick and mortar, mortar bookstores are disappearing. Reading is moving to screens as eBooks uh, replacing the printed book. Although, you know, the video that I, that I shared in the, in the, uh, during the first uh, part of the lecture uh, kind of defies that and yeah maybe maybe uh, uh, the printed books won't disappear as soon as we thought they might uh, but nonetheless they are you know ebooks are building and uh, you know, the new publishing and new distribution tools and power authors become professional publishers while eroding the monopolistic edge once held by the large large publishers now with with somebody like uh, Again, if you're self-publishing, so to speak, but you're working with Amazon, a number of the uh, uh, authors who are practicing author 2.0 then then are hired, are paid by regular book publishers to to move, you know, to contract with them for their printed books. And so you can start one place and go the other place. You can start as a as, as a book author for a regular. Uh, printer, and then you can start uh, you know, selling some ebooks as well if you choose to. Uh, so it's a, it's a whole new ball game. Uh, this is uh, the the trends towards uh, future publishing the ebooks uh, as a percentage of of the U.S. wholesale trade market. The uh, the video we just watched suggests that it pretty much peaked out here that that it did not build much more than this. Uh, I don't remember the exact numbers in the video, but it seemed like it was only about this, you know, out about the two, 2010 number uh, percentage. And maybe it's up towards uh, the 20, but uh, this is, doesn't have a date on it. So this suggests maybe this is projection. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but um, maybe it's up to 20% now, but that was not any more than that. I'm pretty sure that the, the printed uh, uh, books are are outnumbering the uh, ebooks by a lot, according to that video. And I, I have to go back and remind myself exactly how much that was. But uh, so that's a surprise. Uh, the idea, you know, thinking was goodbye printed books. But as I said, that doesn't mean that there isn't a great opportunity here for entrepreneurial authors, because there is, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the digital distribution enabled authors and publishers to efficiently reach a global market. So that's a big change is that, you know, I, before it was pretty much uh, books were national, they weren't international. And so now they're still, the, the printed versions are somewhat national, unless you're a big name and then you might 
cover a few, you know quite a few different countries, and they might you might get um, you know translated and go even to more more countries. So Stephen Covey, who I I teach uh, his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People in my Success Strategies course, and uh, you know he was in something like 40 countries and 40 languages, or well 40 languages and more than 40 countries, probably you know more than 100 countries. Uh, so, you know, that can happen. And he was, of course, he was a little different. I think they handled all their book publishing themselves. Uh, he created uh, his own company, and that company was making a half billion dollars a year selling his books and CV CDs and stuff like that. So, you know, it is possible even with printed books to take on your own uh, publishing efforts now with the, the way the market is. And the way the technology is so that you can get uh, now now it's not that expensive to become a, a print uh, book publisher uh, an oversupply of books and alternative media content will place downward pressure on ebook prices and uh, yeah so you're gonna have to make on ebooks you have to make it by quantity because um, you're not going to get a lot of uh, you know, it, you're not going to get a lot of money for each book, but if the if the uh, printed book market stays high like it seems to be doing, then that that also pulls up the ebooks as well. If the ebook, if the printed books, like I said, if there's a big oversupply of, of printed books, then their prices will come down, and so will the prices of ebooks. But that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, that that uh, you know, there's a big oversupply necessarily. Uh, successful ebook authors are becoming multimedia authors, traditional print and online multimedia. So, um, meaning digital, but also uh, the one of the videos mentioned uh, audio books. So that's multimedia, right? And that's that's basically mostly online. You you can buy CDs and cassettes too. And those are certainly still you know very available, but um, when you get to that, then there's not much difference between buying a CD or, or somehow getting that digital product online at a cheaper price. So uh, I would expect audio books to start being marketed more online, to be more prominent online than, although they end up, you know, if you have a bookstore with printed books, then probably the audio books will be right along with them until they, until those stores close. So uh, Author 2.0 is about empowerment. It's about you and your book reaching a global audience on your terms. And again, that feeds into the, my belief that uh, we're going to, that, that books are going to become more prominent in, in some ways. It may be e-books only, but that we're going to have a fall off of investigative, investigative reporting. Those are going to have to go into book format, which could be, you know, easily be e-books. Um, and probably would be in order for them to get the, you know, somebody who's writing an investigative story wants lots of readers. And so they have a passion for what they're doing typically, and they may, uh, you know, want to sell a lot of ebooks and be willing to keep the price down in order to uh, get a large readership. Uh, so anyway, in your author 2.0 model, uh, you're in charge. <laughs> So you have to become, uh, you know, take on more roles than just writing if you want to be, you know, a, a, an author in the 2.0 model. And so you may, you know, you have to set things up with Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and other book uh, sellers. Uh, you need to seek uh, book, book reviews. You need um, to hold a book launch and a marketing plan, have a marketing plan. Uh, decide if you're going to have multimedia, audio, video books, and you have to produce those. Uh, social, you have to do the social networking and start to publicizing your book. You might want to create a blog, or some people are doing it the other way around. They're doing a blog and then publishing a book from the blog. I thought about doing that. Um, you need to obviously do the writing. You need to do the, uh, do the well, in some cases, do the desktop publishing, or at least somehow do some of the technical side of it. Uh, if you want to be uh, distributed through Amazon, they have a certain format you have to meet. 
and uh, so you have to look at their rules and, and adjust uh, accordingly. Um, and of course, you are an entrepreneur in this case uh, as an ebook uh, publisher. So you're wearing a, a lot more hats if you're an author 2.0, but uh, then you control your own destiny. And, and one of the most important parts of the destiny is whether or not anybody, if you ever have a book distributed, if in the old days, if, if you, you, you would write a book and you'd send it or at least several chapters to a publisher and tell them what you wanted to do and maybe give them a list of your table of contents and they would tell you whether or not they were planned to buy your book. Uh, based on a few chapters, and, and that may or may not still be um, a guarantee, uh, depending on, on you know what they see and that, that you pr provide them. And so, uh, I mean, in a sense, you're an entrepreneur because up until that point, uh, you, you know, you've done all your work for nothing. And so, in that sense, you were still an entrepreneur. But but then the company decided how much they're going to pay you. Typically. Uh, and those, you know, where they controlled it, it was like 18% to the author and 22% to them. Uh, now, if you uh, sell through Amazon, I believe it's, um, I believe they only keep 30% and give you 70%. So, you know, rather than 18% with a book, with a traditional book publisher, you get 70% as a 2.0 author being distributed by, by Amazon. So a uh, very different situation. In some degree, you're an entrepreneur in both directions, but that middleman, that book publisher, takes a lot of profit from you. Uh, so it's very different. Um, so here's a little bit of information about some of those who have made it successful. Uh, at the same time, there has been a rise in self-publishing with authors selling hundreds of thousands on Kindle um, and other book platforms, many are making a great income from this method and have moved into writing full time because of their success. The well-known examples in include Amanda Hawking, who has sold millions on the Kindle uh, and then took a $2.5 million deal with St. Martin's Press to move from indie, from indie meaning independent, to traditional publishing. Others like John Locke, the first author to sell a million on Kindle, have kept their ebooks right, ebook rights and sold print rights in order to capitalize on their success. So, um, yeah. So there are people out there, and there, you know, there's more than just a couple of them here. There's a number of them that are making good income. But uh, my understanding is most of them are uh, writers of of fiction rather than nonfiction. Uh, but, you know, if you're if what you're writing is interesting enough, it could be fiction, too, or nonfiction, I mean. <clears throat> um, so kind of review of what it means to be uh, a, a, an indie author. Uh, you can still do the small print runs on an indie author, but uh, print on demand PLD uh, technology has transformed the way print publishing is done. Basically, the book is ordered from Amazon or another online or real world store. The order goes to the printer who prints just one copy or maybe might print a couple, but not very many, which is then sent to the, the customer. Books are printed when they are needed. No waste, no pulping, no massive outlay for a print run. No need to bother with shipping to customers. It's not just indies who are embracing Embracing this, many traditional publishers are also using the mechanism for blacklist or, or excuse me, for backlist or less mainstream books. So print on demand is, is part of this whole revolution. Uh, I wrote a, um, well, I would co-authored a book. Uh, it was offered for free, so I didn't make any money off it either, but the but I used it, I uploaded it into a uh, sales site. Uh, some people were selling for money and I put mine up for free. And I don't know, in the first year, there, there were 50,000 views of the book. And since it was a book for charity for, uh, I think I, I told you about my, I know I told you about my work with uh, civil society in Kazakhstan. Uh, 
with what we called the Insights into Development uh, Project. And so this was the first book we did for them, and I, I was the publisher of it and put it online. And it, uh, this, I think that the company went out of business, so I don't know how what it reached ultimately, but in that first year, they hit 50,000 views, which I was quite uh, very happy about that. This was their uh, their their website. I don't. Let's say maybe they were recreated, or somebody bought them out, or something. It's a it's a good uh, URL, so maybe they're back into existence. I don't know. Let's see. Um, okay, so this is a. It's like a different company, or maybe it's the same company that made a transition, and so they're um, they are a publishing back uh, platform now. I don't know, maybe it's the same. Um, it's out of curiosity. I go back and just see if if it is the same company. They might have decided to put the old books back up. Okay, this looks like an index, and then this is my book up here. Let's see what happens when I put that in. Okay, so it's the same company they've changed, and uh, and the old ebooks um, don't appear to be functional now. I'm just curious. Uh, I had checked a long time ago, and, and it was uh, gone, and so I, I would have been surprised if it was back up again. But um, anyway, uh, however, I, y you can also do your own ebooks. Uh, so, you know, I the same uh, organization that I was doing it for, I went ahead and put, created my own website, and so we have some of the books on this website, and then the company, the organization that I turned over day-to-day -day management to, um, they have their own website. So they put all the books that I still help co-author and edit their books every year. And now, uh, but this was a, the first website we had that I, I was the publisher of the books and I was also the creator of the website here um, for the organization. So, you know, you can, we had it both in English and Russian, and so in this case, it says it's free. It's just a matter of clicking on, on one, and and it come up uh, to be read, so forth. Okay, um, going on then. I also have a book. I do have a book. It's a religious book that I have on uh, on Amazon. And so I went through this myself. I didn't do all the other co-authoring stuff I should, you know, or the 2.0 stuff. I never promoted it. I thought about doing it, uh, maybe updating it a little bit. And uh, and so that is something I thought about uh, and some other types of books. that I'm, If I really got serious about it, well, I, I'll... I'll on the later in this PowerPoint, I'll talk about some of the strategies. So there's a number of organizations that can help uh, help a person that's doing going to author 2.0. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, of course, we already talked about Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, I'm presuming they're still in operation. Uh, I don't know for sure, actually. But there's a number of other outfits that uh, do the same sort of thing as Amazon. Um, and in fact, the, the American uh, judicial system basically ordered that Amazon could not restrict authors, 2.0 authors, from uh, letting other organizations sell their book. And so part of the deal, I mean, Amazon, 
you have to decide, are you, is this person an employee or do you have a contract? You know, how do you want to treat this person in order to keep their cost down and to be, uh, to not have certain, uh, requ uh, requirements that, that go along with being an employer. Um, they, they, they claim that these people were independent and the courts in America said, well, if they're independent, then you can't stop them from going to these other people too. And so nowadays, uh, if you publish uh, 2.0 and you go to Amazon, they can't stop you from going to these other organizations. Uh, one that I'm going to talk about now is Smashwords, and they basically they help you go to some of these other ones. Um, and they handle print on demand. I'll talk about that some more as, as we proceed. So as I mentioned, at least uh, when I created this PowerPoint, Amazon was paying a 70% royalty. Um, but not every place in the world could uh, could publish through Amazon. I'm not sure how much that's, I'm sure it's changed a lot. But uh, uh, so I'm, I'm sure that they have at least some other countries that are able to self-publish through Amazon, but I don't know. This was the, the website for Barnes & Noble self-publishing, uh, for them to market, for you to be the publisher, them to market. Um, the, uh, the book design designer uh, company, this is a print on demand, so you can make a deal uh, with uh, companies to handle your print on demand for you. Uh, Smashwords also, they, they do everything. So they sell electronically, they do print on demand, and actually, okay, I was wrong. I was saying they're 80%, but they're 80 At that time, anyway, they were 85% royalty, which is really good. And so my thinking was to go, um, I'm working on a book that I, I think I would take to Smashwords. Um, de depending on which way I want to go. If I want it to be really a textbook, then there's another organization that offers other incentives. Um, they do a lot of the marketing to universities and stuff, and it's called uh, Flat World. And so if it's a textbook, I might go to Flat World. But if it's a... Uh, if it was something other than a textbook, I'd probably go to Smashwords. Um, so Jan, John Locke's book, I talked about him already. Uh, he also has an ebook on how I sold a million book ebooks in five months. And so that uh, would be a good uh, resource. One of the best selling ebook authors and one who shares most of his knowledge is a guy named Joe Conrath. And uh, he, his book is called Newbie's Guide to Publishing. Uh, Gigi Book World uh, is the latest in ebook publishing news. Ebook uh, latest, is, I created this uh, PowerPoint a few years ago. And so, uh, who knows? I mean, I even exist. Who knows? Uh, ebook publishing inspiration with uh, Mark Coker. He is the creator of Smashwords. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, he. He, this is his book, but he also is the person with Smashwords that helps other people become 2.0 authors. And then uh, there's an eBooks Q&A with Joshua Talent from uh, eBook Architects. And again, these these two here have uh, audio and video, and this one has audio with transcript. So some of the tips for 2.0 um, is first off, writing is work. And to and that's why I say I, I'm not a serious 2.0 author, or I'd be focusing on it. But uh, I probably have to be when I leave uh, teaching to really have the time to focus on the sort of books I like to do. Although I, I'm working on, you know, I'm working on a couple of them, but they just aren't. We, we have we're so tied up with our coursework and stuff. I it's hard to uh, to do it. So uh, another suggestion uh, is write lots of books uh, because first off, you don't know when suddenly you're going to get noticed. And so it might not be with book one. Um, it might be with book two or book three. But once you get noticed, if you have other books available on that, on say on Amazon, uh, I have a friend, for example, who's published about um, six or seven books. Uh, they are not really tech. They they could be used as textbooks, but they're um, 
Well, he actually teaches uh, a very, very successful course uh, that uh, leads to TESOL certification for Arizona State University. But then he's published the six or seven uh, books that are both print and ebooks, I, I believe both, um, that he sells on Amazon and through some other sources too. So he's he's doing, uh, you know, once I knew he had one, now I, then I looked at the other ones he had. And so I bought a lot of his books and I will buy the rest of them because uh, it's something I'm interested in and uh, they're not overpriced and he, he is a friend. He's actually one of my partners in, in the new business we're trying to start. Um, so anyway, he, um, he's a good example of somebody that is probably making pretty good money. Not, he's not making a million dollars a year because it's, these are academic books. Uh, but, uh, he's probably making a pretty good supplemental income from it. Uh, and so along with this idea of selling multiple books is to write a, a full series, so especially, well, I was going to say with, with, uh, fiction, but it could be nonfiction as well. Um, I have some ideas that go along that ideas, but again, if you, if somehow they relate to each other, then that's even more likely that once people discover one of them, that they're going to, uh, work on the other ones as they're going to buy the other ones too. I don't know why I have my earphones on. I was listening to something. I just never took them off. Um, so, uh, it is, uh, uh, again, you know, these are very good suggestions if you want to be serious about it. Uh, you want to identify your genre again you know the, the if you write a series it's more likely they'll buy all your books if they buy one if you're not a series uh, you're still more likely if they they discover one to buy more of them if it's the same genre and so again it might not be a series per se but they trust you in one genre they will probably read your other books in the same genre uh, and then it says, hey, why, why just do one series? You can create a mul multiple series. Uh, if you're a really serious 2.0 author, you know, it's like I said, you go to work and you, you, uh, you know, go for it. So again, if, since I don't ever want to retire, uh, if I decide I don't want to teach either, then this may be what I do and maybe I won't make very much money, but you know, I've, I've got some, you know, retirement income. And so, you know, I'll take a chance and start writing and writing and writing and hope that I hit it big. Who knows? Um, and then finally, expect that it will take time. If you think that it's going to happen all at once, you're probably, it's probably not going to happen. But this is some of the most important keys are right here on this page. If you want to be a serious author, uh, my daughter is always, uh, my second daughter has always talked about being an author. And this would be, maybe I need to share this with her uh, to, for her to understand that if she, you know, now her kids are all in school, uh, so she has some time, you know, now's the time maybe. I sent her a book about writing children's books. Uh, in fact, it wasn't just, it was a multimedia book, so it had some uh, uh, audio tapes or audio recordings as well, I believe. And uh, anyway, so I got that for her a while back. Maybe she needs to understand this aspect of the job too. Uh, another idea is get ideas organized. Swiss cheese your work. Uh, what that means, Swiss cheese is kind of a yellow cheese with holes in it uh, that's made in Switzerland, obviously. Uh, it may be made other places too, but they use a certain, um, you know, cheese is has bacteria in it. And, um, when it's Swiss cheese, that bacteria is making uh, the, the way they work and and uh, age the cheese ends up making some holes in it. So it's white cheese with holes in it. And uh, I really like Swiss cheese, by the way. I don't think I can find it here. Maybe I can. But uh, regardless, the, I, there, there was a book uh, I, uh, I read many years ago about writing books. And that was their idea is to basically organize your work in such a way that you just think about one part of it at a time. It might be one chapter at a time, but you don't even have to write the chapters in order. If you're suddenly feel inspired about chapter, you know, you're working in chapter three and you get inspired about chapter 11, then you write chapter 11. And so you just, by going to work every day and, and doing the job, then 
you just do a piece here and a piece there and a piece there and you pretty soon the idea of writing a whole book doesn't become so scary. Uh, decide on goals and intended market, decide on a book topic, decide on chapter headings. And so these are kind of the steps and these are part of the, the, the Swiss cheesing of it. Uh, so you, you decide on the chapter headings uh, and expect to change. Don't worry about changing your head headings. Uh, write one chapter at a time. And again, you don't have to write them in order. And in fact, you might start each of them. You have an idea as you're writing the headline, have an idea. So write down your ideas. And that might not be exactly even text that you expect to use, but the ideas turn into text. So when you feel inspired, write. Um, and write. They say write one chapter at a time, but not necessarily uh, if you feel inspired. Uh, rewrite, edit, uh, use beta readers. In other words, you... As you progress, you uh, uh, give what you're writing to friends who are, have agreed to read it. Uh, make sure you have a good title. If this is really important. They say a good title can change everything and, and a good cover. So the two go together. A good title, good cover, uh, it may be the key to success. I'd say there's one other thing I did not add here. Well, it's kind of in, included in this, but... Um, I'm going to put it in here as a sub right here. Use beta readers uh, and editors oops, and editors to keep you on track. And what I mean is when we don't have, um, when we're not fully committed to something, then we may have this idea, and maybe a great idea, and we just don't ever do it. We don't get around to it. We have other, let other things uh, get our attention. And so, but if you make a commitment to people, some of them may even be paid, like an editor, you might be paying an editor uh, or beta readers a little bit. But whether they're paid or free, if you tell them, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you one chapter a month. You're making something reasonable. Don't make it unreasonable. But you tell them, I'm going to give you one chapter a month uh, to cover for me. Is that okay? Are you, can you handle that? Um, and just by, by arranging with your beta readers and your or editors or whatever you call them to be expecting your next chapter by the start of the next month, this now... In Stephen Covey terms, Stephen Covey says we basically have, um, I wonder how quickly I could draw one. I, I guess, I'm not going to try to, I guess. But now basically there's four quadrants. Some of you may be familiar with it. There's, there's four quadrants. And across the top are things that are uh, urgent and not urgent. And down the side, things that are, um, excuse me, yeah, things that are urgent and not urgent. And, and, and the side are important and not important. So... The number one thing of importance in our schedule is things that are both urgent and important, both. And that typically is something, very frequently something that has to do with work uh, or our business or whatever. Um, uh, next to it is are things that are important but are not urgent. And those are very typically things that are goals that we set. Um, and so there's nobody telling us we have to do it. Down at the bottom, there are things that are not important that are urgent. Somebody tells us they're urgent, which suggests important, but they're not really important. So universities give me lots of, give lots of forms and stuff we have to fill out that are not important. But somebody tells us they're urgent. And they set deadlines. They say, you have to do this. And I've been yelled at more than once. Um, and then next to it is the things that are not urgent nor important. Well, that's stuff like TV or whatever. Uh, things that you that have no real that in excessive use anyway or go beyond the needs we all have to relax and so some relaxation some recreation things like that could be in in uh, what what he would call um, in, in section two um, in cell two or whatever you call it and that would be things that are that are uh, not urgent but they are important so they're Things like exercise are in that category. Nobody says we have to exercise, 
But in the long term, that's very important. And so we should. But also things like this, like book writing, if, if you're doing it and you're not, you know, you don't have a, a publisher yelling at you about getting a chapter in, if you don't have somebody expecting your work, it's very easy to fill your time with other stuff. And so you never get the book done. And so I very strongly urge, and, and this is what I definitely would do if I got real serious about my book writing, I would schedule beta readers and editors uh, and expect them and, and tell them and commit to give them a chapter every month. And then, then it moves it, in essence, it moves it from the category of being important but not urgent over to being important and urgent because I have a deadline now and I have people waiting for my chapter. And so it may be a self, self-imposed urgency, but not really because I made this commitment to other people, right? And so somebody's telling me it's urgent I, and I may even tell them ahead of time, uh, get in my case if I, don't, if I don't meet my deadline, I need somebody to make, keep me on, on deadline. So maybe call me a week ahead and say, hey, I, or if, let me put it this way, you know, I don't want you to have to go out of your way too much. But if I don't have not sent you the new chapter by, by the first of the month, then email me or call me and ask me, where is my chapter? And so, so it puts some pressure on me. Um, anyway, so that's, I, I'm going to add that as an important addition uh, to how to be successful as a 2.0 author. Uh, this, uh, I think this was the author of, yeah, Mark Coker is the author of, or the owner of Smashwords I was talking about. And this was one of his uh, books. And so at first he made a very plain title and it got almost no sales. And then he got a, a friend uh, or acquaintance to design his cover. And uh, it suddenly started selling a lot. And so this may not be a great cover, but it's a lot better than this one. And it led, it was good enough um, to, to you know, lead him to massive sales. It's a very good sales. So uh, one of the points he makes is it's worth getting a designer. If you're not, you know, you're probably not an expert designer. Um, you know, I'm an expert in desktop publishing. I began desktop publishing uh, with with PageMaker and another desktop publishing software uh, in the mid 1980s when it first came out, and uh, my PageMaker was the predecessor owned by the same company uh, as uh, InDesign, but then uh, they decided to totally revamp and they stopped producing, they stopped selling um, PageMaker, and now you have to buy InDesign for more money. And I personally, I prefer PageMaker. Uh, some of the stuff, some of the new software, not just by that company, but uh, Microsoft and some others, I, they just actually do. When they decide they're going to change something, they just change it to change it so they can sell more copies and it's not necessarily better. Uh, frequently it's worse. Um, so anyway, but he's saying, you know, buy a designer if you need to. I have one of my students Actually, I was talking about her earlier, the one that co-authored, uh, what, three chapters with me in that, uh, in that book. Uh, two of them taking, uh, I, I gave her the first, uh, you know, the lead author position um, because she did so much on them. But she's an excellent designer, really skilled as a designer. So if I, if I wanted a designer, I'd probably just turn to her. She, she has a, a knack for or design that I, I don't have. I'm a, I'm a good, I'm, I'm good with it, not technology, but not, not, I have, I have, as a newspaper person, I learned design and I had certain design principles I always followed and they always look good. Uh, you know, as I progressed, uh, maybe not at first, because there wasn't, there, design was pretty stodgy among all the newspapers at first. I think mine were, my pages were as good as anybody's, but, in the 19, early 1970s, when I started my career, there wasn't very good design with newspapers, frankly. Uh, mine, as I said, mine was as good as anybody's, um, and maybe better, but it was still, by day standards, or at least by the standards that I adopted later, they weren't that good. So, 
And I learned and learned more and more. And so I, I, I have a strategy, a logical strategy for how to make good design in newspapers. Get me off my strategy and you know, the, I, I wouldn't be, particularly the section that they kind of aim at women, um, you know, the society sort of section with special, I mean, might have stories, might be have recipes one day, might have, uh, you know, interesting uh, feature stories, might be, have uh, you know, something about fashions one day. I mean, that, that section that a lot of newspaper have, newspapers have, they let their designers be much more creative. I wouldn't be a good designer for that. But they, 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 they allow them, I mean, some of the stuff they do, I hate, don't get me wrong, because they, they go so avant-garde, they go kind of crazy with their design. But um, yeah, I wouldn't even try that. I, I mean, I, I can make a good page using my my standard approach, um, but uh, the, my former student, uh, is, she she breaks she breaks the rules and does a great job with it. <clears throat> so uh, this is a, a from a study some time ago, so it may not be exactly accurate now. But this is um, what, what how long should you have a book? I said they sell some books that are really short. Uh, some books are shorter than my than my chapters. Um, and so, where does it stop? I mean, I, my chapters uh, were yeah, they're going with words here. Some of my chapters were they started off at over 20, 20, uh, uh, 20, 000 words, and so basically. It's, um, well, and that was, yeah, that was in words. Yeah, yeah that's what they're, yeah, trying to argue with words and, and pages. So by word count, yeah, it took about three of mine to uh, to be what they would consider, you know, a pretty good, uh, uh, a pretty good size for an ebook. And so the top 10, however, are up here around 120,000. That was, so that would have taken you know about six of my chapters maybe not quite that five chapters and uh in the top 25 you know now the average comes down top 50 the average comes down top 1000 the average comes down so you know it depends what you're trying to do and and like I say i mean creating a 30 page uh ebook and selling it for it may you might sell it for ten dollars and if it's if it's a pretty good topic, you have a good title and so forth. Well, if you can sell, you know, a, a thousand of them for for ten dollars, uh, that's great. If you can sell a hundred thousand for ten dollars, well, yeah, that's a million dollars. So um, if you you know even a even a you know twenty thousand word uh, book might might make you quite a bit of money. But again, for the top 10, the average is up around 121,000, uh, at least in that study. <clears throat> the, uh, so this, uh, the question in this pie chart, I'm not sure if this is the best way to, to, to show the, the numbers, but the, the way that people discover you, uh, the, Biggest number here looks like this one, 29% recommendations from fellow readers online, uh, forums, blogs, message boards, and so forth. So uh, for eBooks, the, the most common way of discovering you is online. And so you can work the, the uh, social media and you can work blog, bloggers who, who uh, are in your area. You can find, you know, there's well, now millions of bloggers so it's a matter of trying to find bloggers who write about, have an interest in the area that you're writing in, if possible, and then try to get them to, you know, give them a free copy and try to get them to review your book or something. So, you know, that, that's the biggest way to promote your book is, uh, you know, with this sort of approach, with forums, blogs, message boards, uh, and so forth. Um, looks like next is down here at 18%. Uh, I look first for my favorite authors. So see, that's what I was talking about earlier. If you, once you, once somebody decides you're one of their favorite authors, they're buying all your books. And so you can go from here to here and suddenly, 
you know, that's about half of the books are from one of those two categories. Uh, 29% and 18% would be uh, 47%, I believe. And so, you know, you, you're making good sales. If you just do those, make, if you have good enough stuff so that uh, you can be considered somebody's, you know, one of, your, one of their favorite authors, then it just takes off and they will buy all your stuff. So you keep writing. Uh, Nick Tyus looks like 11 other, well, in other words, they, they didn't identify it. So who knows what that is. So the, the next identified one is, uh, there's two of them at 7%. One is uh, I browse book covers and I, and if it grabs me, I investigate further. And that can happen, by the way, not just physical book covers, but Amazon. You know, when I, you know, I was uh, looking at these books by my friend the other day and then I want to buy them and I wanted to, uh, I actually was writing a promotion for our business. We're working on together, our research and business. And, uh, I wanted to list his books. And so I just went and looked at that. But every time I looked at one of his books, it also, you know, Amazon is trying to sell more. So it lists, you, know, you can see there another, you know, six books or something that are similar to the one that you're planning to buy. So they're trying to get you to buy more than one book by, you know, two, three, four books. And so uh, the book, the book cover is also important on Amazon. Uh, and then the next one here is uh, I browse randomly, then look at reviews. So it's kind of similar. Um, and Amazon frequently put, re puts reviews on their page too. And then at 5%, uh, I read free ebooks. And if I like the author, I buy their other titles. Um, so that's a way of doing it too, uh, by the way, is to plan on a, a series, but go ahead and give one away. I believe uh, that was what uh, one of the million dollar authors uh, did is he wrote a, a whole series and then gave one away. And that's, that's how he marketed his book. It took off that way. So uh, these are some contacts from Mark Corker. Uh, I'm not, it's no big, you know, I'm not getting paid for, for this, but I like their, I like their approach. You know, they pay like the 85% commission, at least they did, and that's uh, that's a good number. And they uh, uh, do print on demand. So you you uh, work with them to set up your digital book, and you can sell it. And then they also help. I don't know exactly what they do. I haven't tried it with them yet, but they they at least market themselves as assisting you in getting your books marketed on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and they may help with others as well. And, uh, and then they sell them themselves on their own, on own website. But then again, they, they also are selling the books on demand. So uh, they, they have their own printing service and they will ship directly from their site. And I don't know if they still pay 85% on printed books, um, uh, to do so, it seemed like they'd have to charge a lot for those printed books. So I might even voluntarily reduce my commission for printed books in order to get them sent uh, and get them to handle them. So for me, if I got, I would feel very fortunate to get 50% on a printed book. Uh, like I say, in the old days with the standard publisher, you got 18%. So, you know, 50% is a good number. Uh, so for printed books, I don't know what they're charging, what kind of commission they're paying on that. They're, the only thing I saw was 85%, but that's hard for me to believe that that's what they would charge or that's what they would pay on, on printed books. Uh, and if so, then they have, to up, they have to charge quite a bit for those printed books. So that to me, um, maybe, I, I, maybe. Um, this, uh, one of our, uh, you, some of you may have met Krishna. He was, uh, uh, in our journalism department when it first started, he was one of the first uh, professors and he was a long time newsman and he, uh, you know, he's had his story has been published in a lot of different newspapers, but he also wrote this bestseller, um, people power saves Malaysia, uh, about the the election, um, when was that, two years ago now already? 
I guess so. But anyway, uh, his book became a number number one bestseller. And so that's, uh, and he, not sure if that was, if he totally uh, self-published or if he had just had a friendly publisher ready to go. But he had a really good idea and he was working on this book. Um, he started writing the book, actually presuming that that our prime minister would lose, you know, that he would not win, uh, that that he would be cheated out of the victory somehow, that the that the longtime dominant party would win by cheating. And so when that didn't happen, he had to do a, a lot of very quick rewriting. Um, and so I, because I, he had me help him uh, earlier on, and, and as he was writing the book before the election, he had me help him with with the title, and the title was if it was he, he was going to lose, so it was kind of funny. But he had the book out then; he got the book to publisher. Mm, I, I can't remember; it was certainly within a month of the election, so it was by pre-writing as much as he could. And then making a mad dash as soon as the election was over. Um, so anyway, he, he did a good job. He had some good ideas. I'm going to go through real quickly through his slides. He, he uh, did this presentation to one of my courses when I was sick, and so I wasn't able to. So he taught a class for me. Um, you know, writers uh, challenges writers face and how to overcome them. Anything without challenges is boring because challenges mold and train us. Good to enlist help from others when we uh, experience challenges. Um, writer's block is one of those challenges. You just don't know what to write. You're not in the mood and you don't know when you will be in the mood. Writer's block can be very dangerous, especially if you don't deal with it quickly. Uh, relax and take a few deep breaths. Read and read and read. Uh, reading is in, in um, one of the American... Uh, what's the right word for it? Anyway, it's said one of the sayings, I guess, in America is uh, relates to priming the pump. In the old day, days, water, um, you know, either you had to put down a barrel into the well, an open well, in which case it wasn't necessarily real clean water, uh, or if it was, if it was, uh, you had to bring it out with a pump, it was a hand pump. And the old ham, hand pumps, the only way to get them started was to put water into them before you could get water out. And so that was called priming the pump. And we had pumps on my on my family farm that we had to prime the pumps first. And so we, we primed them and then we could turn on the, the electricity to keep the water going uh, to irrigate on our farm. And so um, in a in a you know, in a way, what you're doing when you read is you're priming the pump. If you read and read and read, it gives you ideas, and those ideas uh, help get you, get you thinking, and now you start thinking of your own. It's like brainstorming. It's internal, what I would call internal brainstorming. I believe in brainstorming. I won't go any further into that uh, as far as how it's used. Uh, I used it as a uh, elected official in America and, and in other situations, but you can also internally brainstorm with yourself. And that's part of that is like reading or just pondering. I mean, so my most productive time has been when I was really bored, when I've been stuck someplace with a pencil and paper and nothing else. And so I start writing them on the pencil, on the, on the blank paper, and I come up with new ideas and so forth. And so uh, that's the terms of what you have to do too. First off, read, read, read can prime the pump, but sometimes you just write. You just write down ideas as they come to you. And suddenly as you start writing, it gets your brain into gear and suddenly you're, you're ready to go. Another way, of, by the way, of doing it journalistically is to, again, consider what's the most important thing I have here. What uh, One thing I try to teach Try to teach, try, tried to teach you guys, but others too, is that the wow in your story should be the content, not your writing. Now, that's not always true with fiction writing. I mean, and then it's, the two are kind of interrelated. If it's fiction writing, then, you know, the, 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 
way you write and what you write are pretty similar, but even then you can do um, like the, the author of uh, oh, Tom Clancy's his name wrote the hunt for red October and uh, I forget the name of the way they some of them have been turned into movies. Anyway, he had to do a lot of research because he his books, a lot of his books were based on things that people didn't know about, um, especially things related to spies. And he somehow found out, had friends, maybe some people thought he had to have people in the CIA, friends in the CIA or something to know what he knew. And so he had to do a lot of research in order to get the idea. So even though his books were fiction, he had to do a lot of reading and, and uh, research in order to write them. And so that's, that certainly can lead, you know, get you going like, that way. Um, <clears throat> Lack of ideas, you're very sure you can write that article, but you don't have ideas or points to write on. It happens to everybody, and the good news is that there's a solution to this. Observe nature, taking a look at trees around you or your dog and any other object of nature can give you some of your best ideas. Uh, that's, that's maybe the kernel of the idea, and I do believe in meditation. I know. I know Krishna does too. Um, I do believe in meditation, and some of my best ideas come in meditation. Uh, but uh, again, if you've done the research, uh, then that certainly enables you to uh, it, it enables your meditation to be it helps your meditation to be more more effective because you already have something in there. Uh, read anything good, of course, that comes your way. Reading is a cure for to lack of ideas. Research what you write, to, what to write. Use Google, social media sites, and websites to ignite some of your own ideas. Uh, lack of productivity. This can be a huge problem on its own, especially if you live in an environment filled with children or a busy and unproductive environment. Uh, this goes back to what I was saying. Uh, get it over into that quadrant. Um, I've forgotten the name. That's what uh, what Covey calls it. Four quadrants. Get over the quadrant that is urgent and important. The writing of the book is important to you if you want to write a book, but has it become urgent? And that's where making a commitment to your, you know, finding some people willing to read it and making a commitment to send them a chapter every month or whatever uh, can put it over into the urgent category as well. Important and urgent. Uh, lack of confidence. Uh, this is the most dangerous problem that can plague a writer. It doesn't matter how skilled you are or how much experience you've got. You won't go so far unless you are confident of what you have to offer. Getting real clients for your book. <clears throat> um, so look for a group of people, organizations who need your service. This thing to compile is a list of individuals or organizations that will need your service. Um, I think here when he means service is the information you have. Um, and there's other ways, I guess, I, he's not real clear on this. And I was in the hospital actually when he taught this, so I'm not exactly sure what he means by this. Um, I had ideas in the past, and I still think it's possible to sell advertising in books. And actually pay for the printing and pay pay some gain some profit from advertising. Um, you have to find the right companies to buy the advertising, uh, but I think that is possible. Uh, that's something to think about. That's one type of client that he probably was not talking about. Uh, but you know, if you have a client that that you're writing nonfiction like he was. Maybe there's somebody that some organization that really, you know, it might be a political organization, might be uh, an environmental organization. Half what you're doing is, deals with the environment, a political organization, uh, an education organization, somebody to, to help support uh, the writing of your book. And obviously that would be nice to have somebody supporting, not just, you know, maybe financially, but uh, if, it's, if it's not financially, at least in getting word out to help you uh, promote it. Uh, the fear of selling. We're all afraid of selling because we believe people will hate us. Uh, they will condemn us and pe some people will 
even say we've sold out. This is natural, but the sooner you realize that you have to sell every day is more you start embracing that aspect of yourself to make yourself a better seller. And so, especially if you're going into 2.0, you have to learn to sell. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, it could mean going to bookstores and, you know, bring taking copies with you to the bookstores and uh, selling them on the idea of, you know, selling your books. Um, so that may be one way of doing it, maybe selling in some other sense. Okay, we're out of time. Um, how much more do we have here? Yeah, it still has quite a few other ideas. Um, so most people complain about not gaining traction, but ask them what they have done to gain traction, and it is nothing. Gaining traction is easy, retaining it is difficult, but both are things you can do. The key to gaining traction is selling yourself and ideas to other people. You need to be creative and smart uh, and smart to get traction. Again, um, this may be the 2.0 part of some marketing that he's talking about, or it may be uh, before you even start writing, you, you need some to sell your idea. Um, but life is full, full of sales opportunities and that you need to market yourself. Uh, uh, emotional breakdown, uh, I'm not going to go into that because uh, we're out of time. Isolation, isolation, negotiation, no matter how important your work is, make sure you don't, you aren't alone too, too long. Take regular breaks to be with friends. Negotiation and sanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results, according to Albert Einstein. Um, so I guess he's trying to say here is, you know, if one thing's not working, then try something else. Um, I'm not sure that I would call that negotiation, but he wanted to make it similar to isolation, I guess. Uh, most people complain that, that about not getting a better deal from their clients while still offering the same service. Again, I'm not sure what he's meaning by this in this context. I'm going to go on. Um, anyway, a lot of this stuff you can read on your own if it's important to you. Um, I don't think I would include it. Uh, network, 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 that part I might. Uh, positive word of mouth publicity is an essential part of any book marketing plan. Start by telling your friends and family about your book, then broaden your search to include co-workers and professional acquaintances. Of course, in this day and age, social media is an important part. I've, I have very consciously built, uh, you know, from, from the time that uh, Barack Obama won the U.S. presidency and I started realizing how important social media uh, were, I have started building my, my social network. Um, I don't spend a lot of time, but I spend some time most days, at least in the social media that I like the most, that I think are most important for me, and that's Facebook and LinkedIn. And I've discovered LinkedIn is probably the, uh, there's, fly over here, sorry. Um, is probably the most important for what I'm trying to do. Uh, and I won't, that's more of a marketing idea. I might share it another time, but um, I've got almost 25,000 connections in LinkedIn and that uh, has already paid off important dividends. So that's one area where I would market a book. Um, and there's other ways, other things you can market on LinkedIn, like a blog, things like that to, again, help get to market it to your book. So I would blog, I would, um, I think blogging would be very important and I would uh, certainly uh, do a lot of uh, uh, videos, online videos, uh, maybe, uh, so kind of like a video blog, but it's not really a blog, it's, it is a straight video, but it's excerpting something out of your book to share on a YouTube video and uh, make sure you have keywords and everything so that people can find you. And again, you know, you just need to get people to come uh, learn more about you. And once you sell them on um, like with something like that in your blog and in YouTube, you could get them to come to your website and give them a free ebook um, or a free chapter out of your ebook or something to get them going to whet their appetite. So that one definitely, I'm going to, yeah. I want to put
put that in red just to remind myself um, of the importance of that. And maybe, maybe be on a test. And so the next step for promoting your book might be to inform local organizations, such as clubs, churches, synagogues, and book clubs. Uh, you can also network over the internet by searching for organizations interested in your book topic. Uh, create a professional uh, looking media kit. Uh, this is certainly important to uh, take out. You know, do your PR, That's basically PR, and uh, get out to the media and get them to try to uh, review your, your book or tell, just give them a news angle to it. That's really important in PR is find a news angle. I, I got public relations stuff when I worked for a corporation. I got public relations published on the front page of, of a daily newspaper and on the front page of the local, the metro section. And so if you can find an angle that's interesting enough, um, then, you know, you can get $100,000 worth of publicity from from the media if you can find the right angle for it. Yeah, it talks about the World Wide Web some more, like I've already talked about. And newspapers and magazines that might uh, review it or promote it. You know, promoting your book is not a task that you can do in a day, a week, or even a month. Often the fruits of your efforts won't be uh, immediately evident. It takes time and persistence to get your book notice. Be prepared for some rejection, but remember to celebrate every achievement. Uh, this might also, in this day and age, there, there are opportunities to become a speaker at TEDx um, uh, conferences and things like that. That's a good way to sell a book is if you can become if you're if you can become a good public speaker, then you could market a book that way. OK. That stuff. Well, this is just uh, some of my thinking from a few years ago that I haven't done. I write more ebooks, uh, print on demand books over the next 12 months, uh, all already started, uh, some nearly done. I have some ideas that I was working on I haven't finished. And uh, what, someday when I have <laughs> some year, when I have a year to work on books, I will start working on those books. I have, uh, and you go find my list again because I wrote some ideas for, uh, for each of these genres that I wanted to work on, religious, academic, and also on how-to and also fiction, uh, different genres that I wanted to work on. Okay, I'm going to stop there and to get this up. Thank you.